So I'm Pauline Yu, president of ACLS, and it's my honor to introduce Professor Lynn Hunt, who is our 2019 Charles Homer Haskins Prize lecturer. Tonight's lecture will be the 38th in this annual series, which is named for the first chairman of ACLS. The executive committee of the delegates to ACLS selects the prize winner from the many worthy nominations put forward by our community. The lecturer's charge, which Professor Hunt has so graciously accepted, is, quote, to reflect on a lifetime of work as a scholar, on the motives, the chance determinations, the satisfactions, and the dissatisfactions of a life of learning, and to explore through one's own life the larger institutional life of scholarship. We do not wish the speaker to present the products of one's own scholarly research, but rather to share with other scholars the personal process of a particular lifetime of learning. Lynn Hunt is the author, co-author, or editor of hundreds of articles and reviews and more than two dozen books, which have been the subject of many scholarly forums and have been translated into some 14 languages. Much of her work, from her first book to more recent publications, has focused on the French Revolution, whose societal underpinnings motivations and global ramifications, she has explored through innovative boundary crossing approaches. Reading deeply into culture to seek out what prepares the ground for historical change, she has done pioneering work that examines how gender and cultural structures redefine the lives of people who carry on through and after that change. Using Freud as a means of asking questions that connect the ordinariness of daily life to the extraordinary actions of revolution, she noted in 1992, for example, that, quote, politics do depend on imagination, and hence to some extent on fantasy, and family experience is the source of much of that fantasy, end quote. Her scope has also widened to consider broader historic, historiographical issues with both vision and reflection, and even wider to changes in the humanities and higher education as a whole. And now, in her work of the last 15 years, she, she has made the case ever more strongly for the relevance of history and historical thinking to the world of today. Shifts in personal attitudes, she's argued, not only seen in literary innovations like the novel, but advanced through such creative forms, can transform how we think about other people in truly consequential ways. In her 2007 Inventing Human Rights, for example, Lynn shows how readers of the novel learned to extend their purview of empathy, quote, across traditional social boundaries. As a consequence, they came to see others people they did not know personal, personally as like them. Without this learning process, equality could, not have, could have no deep meaning, and in particular, no political consequence. In History, Why It Matters, published last year, Hunt describes why we need the study of history more than ever in a time when political debates about war memorials spark marches, riots, and even murder. Society, amidst political shifts, including the renewed growth of autocracy, forgets, or worse, manipulates the power of exploring the realities of the past. Lynn reminds us of the role that historiographical narration of those realities plays in shaping the myths that individuals act upon. Regardless of all the efforts of past and present authoritarians to manipulate history and control memory, she asserts, history and memory have a way of breaking through thanks in no small measure to the history written and taught by those trained in the discipline. There is no finer exemplar of that training than Lynn Hunt herself. She has been awarded several major residencies and fellowships, including, of course, from ACLS. Her books have been multiply honored with prizes, and she herself received the American Historical Association's Nancy Lyman Rolker Mentorship Award as well as distinguished teaching awards both at Berkeley and at UCLA, where she held the Eugene Weber Chair in Modern European History and now serves as a distinguished research professor. Lynn's legendary generosity and dedication as a teacher extended from the large undergraduate lecture hall to the graduate seminar room. She's also been a selfless academic citizen and was elected president of two of our constituent societies, the American Historical Association and the Society for French Historical Studies. 
I count myself fortunate to have benefited from Lynn's many years of service to ACLS on the Burkhart Fellowship Selection Committee and on our board of directors. And believe it or not, I especially miss being the victim countless times of her prowess on the tennis court. <laughs> I don't know how she covers so much territory, and she's a demon at the net, but always the most gracious of sports. Her golf swing, I'm told, is also a thing of beauty. But tonight we'll have the great pleasure of hearing Lynn reflect on her path within and around the discipline of history, a journey informed by a methodological curiosity of extraordinary range. Please join me in welcoming our 2019 Haskins Prize lecturer, Lynn Hunt. First, as a former ACLS fellow, I want to echo what was said about Pauline much more elegantly last night, which is that she has been a fabulous steward of the ACLS. She has taken a great institution and made it a greater institution. She's taken a really necessary institution and made it truly indispensable. And I know that we will be thinking about her accomplishments for some time to come, even as we look forward to the new directions. It's a great honor, needless to say, to be asked to give this ACLS Haskins Lecture. And I am very grateful for this opportunity to think with you about my own particular journey. But it is not just my life of learning, as if it were an entirely individual experience. I would not be standing before you were it not for the vast expansion of higher education after World War II, the political ferments of the 1960s that shaped my college years, the women's movement that took off just as I was entering graduate school, and the gay liberation movement that makes it possible for me to come here today with my partner of 30 years, Margaret Jacob, and not try to hide it. Yes. it <laughs> it goes without saying, moreover, that without the support, encouragement, and even the admonitions of my parents, my two sisters here tonight, my spouse, teachers, friends, and colleagues, I would never have had a life of learning, much less the privileged one that has brought me to this moment. Since democratization, political upheaval, and the struggles for rights affected my life in such profound ways, it is perhaps not surprising that these have been the main themes of my scholarship. It is less obvious that a girl raised in St. Paul, Minnesota, with German-speaking maternal grandparents, would end up becoming a fervent Francophile, <laughs> who finds in the French Revolution of 1789 ample material for discussing most of the main elements of modernity, from democracy and authoritarianism to pornography and women's rights, not to mention the concepts of revolution, social science, and modernity itself. These were not just political and social movements or concepts, however. From the very beginning of my studies, I was gripped by the question of the role of individuals. How do individuals produce social change? And why do individuals change their minds, sometimes in very radical fashion? Wanting to make sense of that nexus of individual and society, I often found myself wandering into other fields, from literature and art history to psychoanalysis and neuroscience. My colleagues in history sometimes found this straying from the discipline confounding, if not infuriating. Needless to say, the first individual I had in mind was myself. As a teenager, I spent an inordinate amount of time reading what scholars called the Neo-Freudians, especially Eric Fromm and Karen Horney. I was looking for understanding of my own psychological makeup. Yet the best clues were lying in plain sight in our family, which was much like other middle class families in St. Paul. It did have some significant peculiarities, however. My parents met and married and had me and my sister Lee in Panama. My father ended up working in Panama as an electrical engineer after being kicked out of the Naval Academy in Annapolis for not obeying orders. 
my mother graduated at the top of her high school class in St. Paul in 1942 and immediately joined the Women's Army Corps and was sent to the Canal Zone. As a consequence of these displacements, both of my parents spoke Spanish. And after we returned to the United States in 1948, they occasionally hosted visitors from Latin and South America. Foreign languages did not seem so foreign at our house. As a family, we followed many of the usual middle class rituals. We had television from early on because my father loved all electrical and electronic gadgets. <laughs> and every Sunday, my maternal grandparents came for dinner and the Ed Sullivan Show. Grandma and Grandpa, this is me with them in 1947 and my mother, provided a somewhat mysterious link to the old country. Mysterious because my grandfather spoke English with some difficulty, and my grandmother, though born in sparsely populated western Minnesota, grew up speaking German at home. We loved them, but we did not fully grasp them. <laughs> we thought my grandfather was Russian, <laughs> but he was born in the German-speaking part of what is today western Ukraine. He was a blacksmith for the railroad. My grandmother was one of 14 surviving children, shown here with her siblings and parents, and two of her brothers stayed on the family farm near Odessa, Minnesota. Some of my fondest memories from childhood came from the days I spent at that farm when I was 12, helping my grandmother cook for the harvest, pumping water each morning at daybreak, loading wood into the wood-burning stove, lighting the kerosene lamps as there was no running water or electricity, visiting the corn cob cellar that was supposed to provide protection from tornadoes, even using what was for us the exotic outhouse. <coughs> as middle-class children, we were expected to go to college, even though my mother had not, and her parents never made it past the early grades in school. Our ambitions, such as they were, encountered little in the way of obstacles in those prosperous times for white middle-class Americans. My parents lived comfortably, but they were always mindful of every dollar spent. As the eldest of three daughters, I eagerly subscribed to the academic and athletic aspirations of my father. In his basement ham radio retreat, he taught us all Morse code which as a Navy man, he considered essential learning. <laughs> and he readily explained atomic theory and anything else I wanted to know, while at the same time showing me how to throw a softball and a football, and above all, how to play golf, which I played with my parents until I went to college and realized golf was not cool. <laughs> my dad was a great athlete, and as someone brought up, by a demanding grandfather in Newton, Massachusetts after his mother died in an accident, he stood out in Minnesota for his charm, diction, and reserve. We adored him. It was crucial in all kinds of ways that my father was considerably older than my mother, though he didn't look it. Those 16 years difference meant that he felt unthreatened by my mother's yearning to cut through the netting thrown over wives and mothers in the 1950s. She did all that was expected of her, putting dinner on the table shortly after 5 p.m. every evening, growing a vegetable garden, and sewing our clothes. Me and Lee with my dad, and Lee and me with my sister Jane. As you can see, my mother decided to dress me and Lee as identical twins, <laughs> despite the fact that we were two years apart in age. There might be a serious interpretation to be offered of this, but I have not yet figured it out. <laughs> but it was never enough for my mother. And over the years, she steadily climbed an invisible ladder. President of our school's PTA, president of all of St. Paul's PTAs, president of the League of Women Voters, and eventually, once we had mostly grown up, city councilwoman re-elected four times, and then county commissioner five times as well. With her first name, Ruby, 
her relatively tall stature, and her utter lack of airs, she seemed a natural campaigner. And she always believed it was her duty to participate and even to lead when others stepped back. My father had to give up his lifelong affiliation to the Republican Party to vote for her. <laughs> even as youngsters, we got extensive civics lessons. My mother would explain the difference between a strong and weak mayor form of government to anyone who would listen. And she took us along to Democratic Farmer Labor Party booyahs and sent us around the neighborhood to hand out literature about bond issues and charter amendments. My mother spent hours on the phone preparing for meetings and conversations about politics frequently filled our living room. It is no wonder then that I decided to write my doctoral dissertation on two towns at the beginning of the French Revolution and compared one that experienced a violent revolution with one that did not. Local politics was something I felt I could comprehend, even in places far away and long ago. Subject matter was the least of what I learned from my mother who at age 95 is still advising candidates on their campaigns. <laughs> Here she is with the other residents of her retirement home protesting the inauguration of Donald Trump in 2017. <laughs> Needless to say, Minnesota in January is not for sissies. <laughs> and this is her now at 95, I have to confess, holding a copy of my most recent book. <laughs> What most impressed me, it still impresses me, about her was her insistence on overcoming fear. She had only a basic education and no experience of speaking in public, yet she learned to present herself as someone ready to leave what lead whatever the circumstances. Shyness or timidity could never be an excuse for sitting back and keeping silent. Now, nothing in my upbringing foretold a university career, and yet nothing forestalled it either. The women and men of my generation went to college as the number of places was beginning to expand, but in days of relative innocence. No one I knew took the SAT more than once, or got tutoring or coaching for it. Like most of my friends, I applied to, th two, to three or four places, all of them within 40 miles of my home. I went to Carleton College, 40 miles away, because it was a good school and going there would mean not living at home. I had a partial scholarship that included work study several hours a week. So I waited tables in the dining halls and cleaned test tubes in the biology lab where I was working the day Kennedy was assassinated. No one worried about getting a job in the 1960s. For many of us, the main concern was choosing a path, whether the Peace Corps, law school, or graduate school, that would enable us to contribute to changing the world. For me, that has always meant teaching. In <laughs> In junior high school, I wanted to become a junior high school teacher. By the, time I, by the time I got to college, my sights had shifted upward. I was one of those obnoxious kids who loved everything about school and wanted to be in school in one way or another forever. When I was in college, I felt bereft when I went home for vacation. Although I loved my sisters, I emphasize this since they are sitting right there, <laughs> in my way, I missed my friends, the meetings in the library at all hours of the day and night. Carlton was the kind of place where they had to close the library at midnight on Saturday. And the discovery of one new thing after another. College was all about intensity, intense relationships, intense classes, intense tennis playing, and above all else, the swelling wave of political issues that roiled my college years of 1963 to 1967. We organized against the college's notion of in loco parentis, which meant mandatory chapel, dorms segregated by sex, 
and strict limits on the hours women could be out at night, not to mention the three-foot rule. When someone of the opposite sex visited your room during the few hours that was permitted, you were meant to keep three feet on the floor. I spent so many hours in Dean Phillips' office arguing with her that she suggested I should go to law school. <laughs> and we marched. We marched for civil rights, and we marched against the Vietnam War. Even at Little Carleton, with its then 1,300 students, the marches got attention. We were angry a good part of the time, whether at the establishment at the college administration, or at our parents, but never that I can remember at the faculty, who were probably, for the most part, on our side. We felt, collectively, that a veil had been ripped off that was covering our sight. And this made us sympathetic, if not downright enthusiastic, for all manner of revolutionary movements, past and present. I remember with some chagrin now the way I tortured my parents about the virtues of communist China. <laughs> my mother was a Eugene McCarthy Democrat who supported civil rights for African Americans and opposed the Vietnam War, but that wasn't good enough for me at the time. <laughs> Yet in my case, graduate school beckoned even more than SDS. And I went off to Stanford to study German history because one of my young professors at Carleton had recently finished his PhD at Stanford in German history. I had first studied German for obvious family reasons and only learned French as a requirement for a possible German major. Once I arrived at Stanford, however, I discovered that the famous professor of German history had little time for me, whereas the assistant professor of 18th century French history Phil Dawson, could be found in his office just about any time. Since there were no women on the regular faculty of the history department when I arrived, I knew that moral support was going to be important. So I switched from studying the bad revolution, the Nazi seizure of power, to investigating the good one, the French Revolution of 1789. <laughs> The way had been prepared by a charismatic teacher of that subject at Carleton, Carl Wiener. We sat entranced as he paced the floor and banged a sword borrowed from his theater director wife to mark the drama of the arrest and execution of Robespierre, architect of the terror and a leading revolutionary. The political turbulence I experienced at Carleton soon paled as Northern California became an epicenter of protests against the draft and the prosecution of the war. Every one of my male friends had to figure out what to do about the increasingly demanding draft at the time. Flee to Canada, resist induction, or more commonly, figure a way out, whether with the help of a friendly family doctor or coming out as a homosexual. The pressure ratcheted up. And Stanford experienced more upheaval in the years of my graduate study than it ever has before or since. The mass meetings on campus, marches on local companies associated with the war effort, boycotts of classes, and many angry confrontations within the history department were only heightened by the news of revolts in Paris, Prague, and many other places. It was the right time to study revolution. I arrived therefore, in Paris in September 1970, having never been to Europe, knowing no one, not having a place to live, and speaking French only haltingly. <laughs> Sitting in a tiny room in a hotel where I was molested on the day of my arrival by the bellboy on the way up in the elevator, and facing the prospect of the Turkish toilet down the hall when I got food poisoning at a Greek restaurant in the Latin Quarter, I had to review my options. <laughs> I, was, I remember extremely clearly that I was reading Henry James, The Ambassadors, at the time. <laughs> they seemed clear to me. Go home to my parents or stick it out. My very first day, after the encounter in the elevator, I walked over to Notre Dame Cathedral, 
I wrote this before the fire, so I decided I would find a picture from the time when I was there in 1970. And in truth, that had immediately sealed the deal. Paris thrilled me in the way that no other place ever had or would. My situation improved immediately. A friend of a friend invited me for a drink and asked along another American PhD student who happened to be looking for an apartment too. The friend of a friend, Marion Bieber, a German Jewish refugee to London who worked in Paris for the Ford Foundation, was to be a kind of guardian angel for decades to come. And the other student, Chris White, and I hit it off and ended up sharing an apartment that came to me in a serendipitous fashion. One night, when with friends from Stanford, I was looking at a menu of a restaurant near the Avenue des Gobelins, a Tunisian man approached us because he heard us talking about Stanford. He knew one of the history professors, Mark Mangle, and he had a cousin who had an apartment near Metro Cadet in the 9th arrondissement. It was painted bright orange and had a fabulous couscous pot and worked well for two graduate students. Chris was doing her dissertation in political science at Cornell on North Vietnamese land reform, this in 1970. And she had been to Paris more times than she could remember. Habib, the Tunisian, knew everything about North African politics and restaurants. Between the two of them, I got a whole new education, not to mention lifelong tastes for Vietnamese and North African foods. Chris and I went to all the anti-war demonstrations in Paris, and she introduced me to an old family friend, Madame Fézy, a retired school teacher who discussed French novels and plays with me over long lunches at her apartment. I wasn't just hooked, I was fanatical, despite the constant effort required to make myself understood at the archives, which at the time were not famed for their friendliness. As is already evident, a path was cleared for me by a combination of encouraging men and unusually aspiring women. At Stanford, I gained a deep intellectual education from a woman who never got beyond the status of lecturer, Margot Dreckmeyer. She had written a path-breaking dissertation on salons long before the role of women in the Enlightenment got any sustained attention. She was hired at Stanford so that the political science department could attract her husband. Her story was all too typical of the experiences of women before my generation. And it was only after I arrived at Berkeley as an assistant professor in 1974 that signs of change were becoming apparent. Berkeley's history department had gone from one woman in 1970, that is zero in 1969, to four in 1974 in a department of some 55 regular faculty. That one woman who got things started at Berkeley, Natalie Zeman Davis, immediately became my mentor and friend. She gave the Haskins lecture in 1998. Although she left for Princeton before I even came up for tenure, she has been a model for me through the decades of how to create the best possible environments for learning and discovery. Not surprisingly, there is a conference in her honor this weekend at Princeton, for at age 90, she continues to blaze trails. Soon after my arrival in Berkeley, she invited me to dinner at her house with one of the few other senior women in the humanities and social sciences, the art historian Svetlana Alpers. The evening is deeply etched in my mind as we went back and forth about Juliet Mitchell's recent book on psychoanalysis and feminism. Soon I was involved with the intellectually electrifying group that founded the journal Representations. This is number two of Representations in which I had an article. Note that there were also important articles, not that mine was so important, uh, by Peter Brown and Jim Clifford. And my own trajectory took a sharp turn toward a growing preoccupation with language, symbols, and ritual. I also discovered at Berkeley the terrors and rewards of teaching, finally, after so many years of preparation. 
Not only did I benefit from the encouragement of exceptional mentors and truly extraordinary colleagues, but I was also just plain lucky. While still laboriously working my way through my doctoral dissertation, I had managed to be named a junior fellow in the newly established University of Michigan Society of Fellows. I finished my dissertation while participating in the lively workshop in Ann Arbor run by Charles and Louise Tilley, pioneers of political sociology and social history. At the same time, in the Society of Fellows, I met a host of remarkable senior and junior fellows who sent me off in many new directions. Among them were John Darms, who went on to be a visionary president of the ACLS, Pauline's predecessor. The poet and essayist, Donald Hall, who read my fledging, fledgling efforts at making sense. And the junior fellows, Richard Ford, then composing his first novel, Gail Rubin, soon to be a leading queer theorist, and my frequent lunch and pool playing partner, the classicist Bernie Frischer. After two years in Michigan, Berkeley offered me a position with the promise that after one year of teaching, I could go back and finish my third year at Ann Arbor. If that isn't luck, I don't know what is. The freedom I enjoyed to try new paths, not to mention beginning to learn how to write, even while finishing what I needed to finish, had an incalculable impact on my future. I was always ahead of the curve. My luck continued over the years. I had gone into French history when French history as practiced in France reached the zenith of its international influence. And when what was called French theory, otherwise known as post-structuralism or post-modernism, had just begun to make tracks in Anglophone universities. My group at Berkeley included the anthropologist Paul Rabinow, a major interpreter of the French theorist Michel Foucault, and Paul and I set up a French studies exchange program with the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. When I arrived at the University of Pennsylvania in 1987, seeking new perspectives on an unfamiliar coast, I spent my very first year there attending a seminar organized by Joan Scott at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton on the future of feminism. Among its participants, Judith Butler, Donna Haraway, and Joan Scott herself would soon transform the field. At Penn, post-colonial studies, that is attention to the ways Europeans had colonized not only nations, but even thought itself was just gaining traction. Finally, when I returned westward to UCLA in 1998, I could not have found a better environment in which to deepen my longstanding interest in visual studies and learn about the burgeoning field of neuroscience. Thanks to Margaret Jacob, I was invited to participate in an unusual seminar of young research psychiatrists who talked about their work, whether with people, frogs, or slugs, and also about more general issues such as the decline of psychoanalysis and the rise of pharmacological psychiatry and neuroscience. Now, this litany of names and places may have made you think of me as a kind of zelig character <laughs> who was carried away by the currents of the latest fashions. But I prefer to think of myself as eager to get a handle on how new approaches might fruitfully reorient historical studies and make them even more salient for students. My focus on the 18th century and the French Revolution never wavered, even when I wrote about more general issues of method and historical truth, nor did my aims. Understanding why people became actively involved, what made people change their views suddenly and radically, or to put it another way, what enabled people to believe that they had rights. My experiences in the university only intensified the urgency of those questions, and at the same time spurred the search for novel solutions. When I was promoted to full professor at Berkeley in the mid-1980s, I was the youngest among 41 full professors, and for a time, the only female. Needless to say, I was also the only lesbian. There were two older gay men on the faculty, but they, like many gay faculty, were very secretive about their lives. It followed logically, it seemed to me, that I had to insist 
that it was unacceptable for the department to be as it was then, I'm talking about the mid-1980s, not the mid-1960s, entirely white. The department had hired several women after 1970, but no minorities. My senior colleagues agreed, and that too began to change, reflecting broader transformations in US universities and American life. In 1987, 17% of history faculty in the US were women. Only 5% were minorities. By 2007, the proportion of women in history had doubled to 35%. Minorities reached 15%. Those figures tell of outcomes. They cannot convey the day-to-day -day struggles that took place to make these changes happen one contested appointment at a time. Since higher education was undergoing a halting but nonetheless profound transformation, as Jews and then women and minorities began to claim positions, first as students and eventually as faculty, it is not surprising that these new faces would prove open to approaches that used criticism of the status quo to advance innovative arguments. The conflicts over civil rights, the women's movements, the women's movement and gay liberation made it clear that identity and attitudes towards difference mattered. In my dissertation and first book, my questions had been shaped by the mounting concern with social location and identity. To get at why some places had violent revolutions and others did not, I looked at the social identity of the individuals involved. Marxist-inspired historians had long maintained following Marx himself that the French Revolution marked the triumph of bourgeois capitalism over aristocratic feudalism. In the 1950s and 1960s, however, Anglophone historians had shown that the leaders of the French Revolution at the national level had come not from the capitalist manufacturing class, but from the ranks of lawyers and owners of minor judicial offices, judicial offices being bought and sold in France before 1789. I decided to test the Marxist hypothesis on the local level by studying the men who held office in two manufacturing towns at the end of the old regime and comparing them with those who replaced them in 1789 and 1790. Textile manufacturers did play a more important role in the revolution on the local level, but hardly a decisive one. And I discovered something that intrigued me. Those who embraced revolution in 1789 tended to be outsiders who were nonetheless not completely different from the insiders. True, there were some important social differences between them. The old regime elites were wealthier and better connected than those who replaced them. But their successors were close enough socially to aim to unseat them. Over time, and perhaps with the example of my mother in mind, I came to see that being an outsider in this sense was really a cultural category that could take any manner of social forms. To get a wider angle for my next study, I determined to look at the revolutionary activists in four major cities, one in the north and one in the south, one in the east and one in the west of France, this time over the entire revolutionary decade. In that pre-personal computer age, I went around local archives with four by six index cards, recording occupations, tax records, addresses, club and Masonic Lodge memberships, and marriage contracts. The most challenging were the marriage contracts, which could be a couple of pages long or run to 20 or 30. Some notaries kept their records in loose alphabetical order, all the A's together but paging through literally 200 years of dust to find the contract of one particular person could be daunting. Sinusitis became an occupational hazard. <laughs> the payoff was the picture that slowly emerged, which helped me to solve the puzzle of why certain people became involved. I came to the conclusion that the revolution on the local level was propelled not by one social class or group, but by a particular kind of outsider who could mediate between local and national concerns. They were immigrants across local, not national borders, Protestants, Jews, school teachers, actors, and merchants too. 
That is, men who had ties to national networks of culture, power, religion, knowledge, or commerce. Working with graduate students at the dawn of social science computing, I was able to test hypotheses about social identity in an even more quantitative way by gathering every possible statistic on the regional level about voting patterns, adherence or resistance to revolutionary measures, demography, and economics. The graduate students were only allowed access to the Berkeley computer, then occupying an entire room, when the scientists had finished with their work. And they had to key punch, an example of students key punching in 1970, they had to key punch all of the data and the programs to analyze it. In the paper we did together on this question, we found that the left was strongest in the periphery where it is still strongest today in France, and the right did well in more urbanized areas. It turned out that cities with large populations of frequently unemployed wage workers and day laborers could become hotbeds of right-wing republicanism, populist royalism, and bonapartism. In short, the Marxist model of revolutionary workers and anti-aristocratic bourgeois merchants could not explain the complexities of local or national politics. Even as I was gathering more data, I was looking in a different direction, away from social identity and toward political culture. First, that meant understanding the ways in which my relative outsiders could serve as culture and therefore power brokers and thereby collectively bring about a shift toward wider participation and a sense of belonging to a nation that itself exercised sovereignty. I became increasingly aware that this passage from a hierarchical aristocratic society governed by a ruler who claimed divine right to one in which the people in some sense ruled themselves required much closer attention. The revolutionaries were trying to transform France almost literally overnight. And to do this, they had to create a new language and culture of politics that relied heavily on visual symbols to engage a population that was only 50% literate. As a result, my studies of local revolutionary elites and regional political differences had to be combined with chapters on revolutionary symbols, festivals, and rituals. New people did not automatically produce a new political culture. In many ways, it was the emerging political culture that attracted new people. This is not to say that language or culture was the determining force. My metaphor was the Möbius strip with political culture on one side and social groups on the other, but with no clear separation between them. With the attention to political culture came an opening to fields usually left out in historical accounts, especially art and literature. The French Revolution let loose a flood of newspaper and pamphlets, which had long been staples of historical scholarship, but it also inspired a massive outpouring of commemorative portraits, scenes of events and battles, and caricatures of politicians and new social habits, either in the form of subscription engravings or cheaply fabricated etchings. These prints had long been overlooked as unworthy of serious analysis. My study of revolutionary symbols had revealed a divergence between the choice of a female or male figure. The symbol chosen for the seal of the Republic was a female allegory of liberty. But as the revolution radicalized, some proposed that it was more appropriate to represent the people by a version of a virile, even popular, Hercules, shown here holding the figures of liberty and equality in his hand. I had documented this implicit contest, but not really explored it. In my next study, therefore, I examined what I called the family romance of the French Revolution, the working out of a new model for the body politic. If the nation had been represented by a quasi-divine father figure who had now been executed as a traitor, what would take his place? A band of brothers, as the slogan liberty, equality, fraternity suggested? What then was the role of women? Were they just symbols? To get at the largely unconscious forms of this set of tensions, I found it fruitful to consider the major paintings and prints inspired by those paintings and popular novels of the period. 
as well as the evidence from prints, such as this slide of women marching to Versailles in October 1789. These showed, taken together, that there was great anxiety about the new roles for men and women. Many of the popular novels featured orphans, as if the French were uncertain about what life was going to be like after the killing of the quasi-divine royal father. Pornography became unavoidable. Queen Marie Antoinette had been the focus of a scurrilous campaign in pamphlets and prints. The one on your left is an example, which helped to bring her to the guillotine, even though as a woman she had no official role in government. Then there was the question of the Marquis de Sade. That's the right-hand side of the slide. How could I not wonder why the ultimate expression of pornography as a Western genre had been articulated in France during the revolutionary decade. Just when psychoanalysis and heaven forbid psychohistory were being categorically dismissed, I was finding Freud and especially the notion of the unconscious to be essential. The pornography was not just titillation. It was a kind of bizarre rumination on the meaning of social and especially familial relationships. The transition to a more democratic society was not like sledding downhill. Lurching into the future unleashed a torrent of worries and fears. Some of them were painfully explicit, such as the menace of invasion by counter-revolutionary armies, but others remained unspoken or barely articulated. And many of these were reenacted in the new genre that emerged during the French Revolution, melodrama, in which thrilling action, scary music, and spectacular stage effects combine to terrorize patrons as a form of entertainment, and in this way provided a kind of catharsis for the real life terror everyone had experienced in 1793-94. Running as a red thread through these productions was often a secret about parentage. What was individual identity and the role of the family in the new order, in which revolutionaries had explicitly limited paternal powers, instituted divorce on surprisingly modern terms, and even granted legitimacy to bastards. They had also, without drawing attention to it, eliminated sodomy from the penal code. When I was finishing this study of the family romance, I was asked by my Western Civilization textbook publisher if I would do a document collection on the French Revolution. On my mind was the question of women's rights, those women gained and those they did not get during the French Revolution. Women got the right to divorce on equal terms and equal inheritance rights. They did not get the right to vote. To make sense of the woman question, however, it seemed necessary to consider the other groups demanding and often getting rights. In the chronological order of their consideration, they were actors, executioners, Protestants, Jews, men without property, free blacks, and finally, slaves. Having brought together the documents on all these groups and translated and annotated them, I was prepared to tackle the subject in a book that included comparative discussion of rights in the new United States and Britain. Human rights are now the subject of fervent discussion in many fields. So little was this true for history in the 1990s that my document collection was cited in reviews of historical scholarship on the subject. I would like to think that my 2007 book on the subject, Inventing Human Rights, helped ignite historical interest, though not because it convinced everyone. In that book, I pushed even further my cultural and psychological arguments. How could slave owners and aristocrats, men like Thomas Jefferson and the Marquis de Lafayette, come to believe that all men were created equal and endowed with inalienable rights? Although it is undeniably crucial to understand why they limited rights, especially political rights, it is nonetheless remarkable how far the notion of rights could be pushed at the end of the 18th century. 
By 1794, the French had had to agree that actors, executioners, Protestants, Jews, free blacks, and slaves had the same rights as other French men. The notion of equality requires learning to empathize with people who are not like you. I emphasized the impact of new cultural practices, the rise of portraiture, listening to music in silence, insisting on personal space, whether by building bedrooms or not sleeping three or four to a bed, and in particular, the sense of sacredness and inviolability of the individual body that made cruel punishments increasingly unacceptable. And especially new practices that encouraged cross-class and cross-race identification, such as novel reading. I was struck by how people changed their minds so suddenly, for example, about brutal corporal punishment, about rights, and even about slavery, and for some, rights for women. Once a certain notion of rights takes hold, it can prompt questions no one ever envisioned. This is precisely what I cherished about teaching. You did not get students to change their minds. You ask questions, provide materials for discussion, and somehow reading, discussing, thinking, writing, your presence even, they all magically combine, not to produce a given or predetermined outcome. Often, in fact, an unexpected outcome. The difficulty has been to keep reproducing the conditions for that magic, when students worry more about their futures, and when public colleges and universities especially face financial constraints that lead to larger classes, fewer requirements, and just generally more haste all around. Still, for me, teaching has been a constant reminder that my life of learning is not just my life. It is probably clear by now that I am an enthusiast <laughs> about the French Revolution, about new approaches, about teaching, and about history in general. For this reason, I have often collaborated with others. Here, Margaret Jacob and Joyce Appleby, and then Peg and Feinant Meinhardt, our Dutch colleague, and myself when we were at the Getty including with students and younger colleagues, and devoted a fair amount of time to writing textbooks or guides explaining new trends. It may be that my own specific sense of not fitting in made me just a bit more sympathetic to the difficulties students often face when reading history books or taking history courses. We scholars are experts in our fields, but often less than expert at explaining the meaning of our knowledge or why anyone else should care. My own outsider status resonated, as you can see, with that of my historical subjects. I felt outside, but not so much removed from the inside that I couldn't speak, or in my case, try to mediate between the two sides. In my work, therefore, I tended to push the envelope but not tear it to bits. With those closest to me, I have not had to worry about being an outsider. And with no one have I collaborated more frequently and more rewardingly than Peg Jacob, an internationally renowned historian of Newtonianism, the Enlightenment, and the Industrial Revolution. Where I was a fanatic about France, she was a fanatic about archives. I have never seen anyone make more out of a trip to a new library or archive. Waiting for the delivery of an item, she would rummage through the card catalogs and call up something that caught her attention, if only for the vagueness of its description, 40 volumes on. <laughs> Pathbreaking articles and even new doctoral dissertations were often the result. For 30 years now, she has been my constant companion in work and life, and the biggest reason why my life of learning is not one single life, but is definitely a life worth living. Thank you.